Hi everybody, welcome to Replenish Earth Live. I'm Tia Kansara, your host, and I have quite the special person for you today. Um, this person's at the intersection of science, food, community, entrepreneurship. This person aims to inspire solutions for important challenges in the human nature of relationships. This person has published dozens of uh, papers in peer-reviewed journals in multi-sensory science and, uh, and also co-created a multi-sensory VR experience to take viewers to the Amazon forest and also has to his name a spoon that enhances flavor perception and um, nudges towards healthier eating, uh, mindful eating, and uh, all whilst he was at University of Oxford uh, between 2013 and 16. And this person, lastly, uh, and more recently has starred in um, a Netflix series, a show called The Final Table with Rodrigo Pacheco. I'm very excited, Charles, uh, Michelle, for you to be on our show. Uh, welcome. It is an absolute pleasure <laughs> to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tia. It's so special to um, to to be part of this, and uh, you know, I've been a fan uh, of Replenish Earth since the beginning, and I'm so glad um, to to be sharing this space with you today. Thank you for the intro. Yeah, absolutely. I got really excited when. Uh, whilst what kind of one of one of the things that uh, I suppose I'm so grateful to you for, Charlie, is um, that you know much of the replenish Earth sort of conversations, at, at least you know 2015, 14, as as we were sort of exploring community, communing, um, sustainability as it was emerging, and you know a lot more of the sort of the fight aspect, right? Like, oh my God, we've got to do something about this. We've hmm. you know we've got to take it upon ourselves, and I and I suppose when that was really setting in and I was doing a lot of the architectural work in smart cities but sort of like moving into more of Replenish Earth you were there to sort of um, to, to co-curate uh, much of, of, of those kinds of questions and uh, conversations so it's, an, it's a really interesting moment in Replenish Earth's sort of time but also in the work that you're doing and congratulations on becoming a consultant in innovation networks and public initiatives for the World Food Programme in Colombia. Very excited. Last time we were there together, 2016, we visited the Sierra Nevada Arawaka tribes and we were there at the, the base of the mountain, hoping very much overnight that we would get mm. like an, an invitation because they just recently closed their doors to the public. So it's been quite the journey for the both of us. And I am mm. uh, would love to sort of spotlight some of the uh, direction that you're going in and some of the questions that you're asking? Hmm. Well, that's a big question. Um, but yes, it does feel that, you know, I want to start with wh wh where you started, which is that there's um, an important calling for our generation and for everybody who's alive today. Uh, if you listen close enough, if you look close enough, um, we are experiencing, um, you know, a transition of sorts or you know, at metamorphosis of sorts. Um, at least that's what injustices are calling for, right? Um, in whichever way injustice manifests in the world today, and the world has never been perfect. Um, and there's, you know, there's this force uh, of, of change that is always present um, today more than ever, because we have the capacity, we have the capabilities to, um, to live in harmony, um, which is something that the Arwako Mamo um, uh, told us about so deeply, this importance of uh, finding our civilization, of finding our, um, our calling as a species uh, in finding balance with um, all life, um, really. When we say nature, it's really all life on earth. How do we invent a world that works with, for everybody and for all life? And, and that is the challenge, and it's such a big one that sometimes it is even um, scary, daunting, and it kind of creates almost a barrier of like, who am I to say, who am I to do, who am I to, uh, what can I do really? Um, but there are ways in which we can all start. Every single drop in the ocean counts to make the ocean. And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of, I guess, where, where my energies have been um kind of focused in the past years personally and i know that you know together we've been um 
conspiring, creating um, with uh, with uh, dear humans all over the world uh, that believe that uh, this that just understand and hear the calling. Um, where we take it now is up to us and uh, up to how we design and imagine our lives in the in the in the decades that we have to live um, in this form and and then also you know thinking of future generations and um, and how we establish better living systems and that is you know something that I've always felt inspired by your work as you know at the intersection of um, architecture and city building and regeneration um, that there's so much to to, to explore and to learn and to, all the solutions are there, right? So where do we start? Totally. Um, where, wh you know, where do you feel, there's, su there's such an interesting kind of multidisciplinary nature to your work. And I find that, you know, when it comes to whether it is uh, the food, the art, the, um, it's almost as if there is this sense, there's this essence in what you create and, I, I remember a while back whilst you were exploring these sorts of, you know, the, the kind of like the sink in, the multi-sensory experience. So even when it comes to architecture, it is a multi-sensory experience. You're entering a space. There's a spatial essence that you have, whether it is the exploration of, you know, wabi-sabi or um, I think we just mentioned it in, a, in the, the previous, you know, one of the previous talks, but th this sort of like the jump into, um, you know, our space and how that space interacts with us is very much like the seasonality of, of the planet. And I remember this once when you were talking about Las Danusas and actually even before, way before I'd even visited, um, you know, Daira and Rodrigo in Las Danusas to go and visit the uh, farm and also to learn about the seasons and how you sort of, you, you give people the experience of the concept of time. And I remember this sort of, quite vividly how you would allow people to sort of, you know, enter, um, you know, the, the beach area, bring in the food, bring in the experience. And then as the sort of, as time was going on, you were, you were almost inviting them to, what does it feel like when time is not endless? Like there is this sort of, almost the sense of time and creating the experience that would then give the questions of where, you know, where does time play a part in your life and how sacred almost these experiences can be with nature, with oneself, with, you know, the communing of people. So where is it that you are now with that, um, the, the sense of spatial dynamic, temporal dynamic? Um, where are you with, um, you know, the essence of the, of the art form uh, in that? Sorry, that's a really big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just uh, thank you for for opening that. Um, I just feel that the answer is, you know, it's a big question, but the answers are infinite. Um, but there's one that I feel just is, you know, is feels true right now, which is just being in a place um, and knowing where you are and 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 connecting to the land around you and the story. Um, there's this uh, amazing um, book called Soul of Place by Michael Jones, uh, which calls for um, understanding the soul of a place and try to find kind of um, the life, the, 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 the essence of a people or a group of people living with their environment uh, through art, through um, culture, through um, uh, the way the spaces are built, um, and 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 through celebration, right? How do we celebrate? How do we find um, in the daily and in the the kind of uh, the course of a year, right? Which is in a way, I mean, our 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 dance around the sun is a, a unequivocal truth. Uh, our dance with the seasons is unequivocal truth, right? The, the 23.5 degrees uh, of inclination that the of the Earth axis turning around the Sun and and creating those seasons that's kind of you know that's our cycle that's our the circadian rhythm of the planet um, so to speak and so how do we connect with those elements um, within our immediate surroundings whether we are in a 
huge city or in the countryside or somewhere in between. Um, you know, I feel I feel the joys right now of this rain that is falling in France. Um, I've been here since the beginning of the pandemic, and um, and after two months of drought, um, which are quite unusual, uh, seeing the rainfall feels like a blessing, right? If I were not connected to time and space in a way that I am now because of the length that I've spent connected to this land, I would I might not be grateful for the rain as I am now. And and I wouldn't understand the cycles of the plants that are giving me the fruits that are that I'm, that that we're picking in the in the coming days, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and, and so of course there's a privilege to being able to to even own land. And I think that's um, that's really the the, the the issue I think is an issue uh, of principles of morals and of laws really, and this is something that we talked about years ago. Why why is it that the earth has no rights? Right in a, in a, in the past few centuries we've figured out a way to kind of give rights to humans and um, you know hypothetically equal rights to every single human that is born on this planet. Um, hypothetically, because it's definitely not true yet, right? So reality still has to catch up with morality. Um, and in a way, I'm saying, you know, I understand my the, the privilege that it is to even be able to ask the question of how do I connect with time and space in a way that is um, that is nourishing, that is um, regenerative, that brings beauty to the world. Um, and so, Every single human in, in, in my kind of dream morality, every single human would have the fundamental right to access a piece of land. Uh, we are an agricultural species. We are, we are born and societies and cities are born because or thanks to agriculture. Um, thousands of years ago, uh, we didn't have the technology that we have now and we destroyed landscapes because of extractivism and not knowing that we needed to give back. Some civilizations kind of disappeared or had to migrate because of land degradation and the degradation of their natural resources. Some others found balance and are still living today in ways that are um, you know, the way that they were a thousand years ago maybe. Um, so the question is thinking about the perennity of humankind and the deep meaning of what is a human for you know for the legacy out in time out in out in infinite space and time which is you know in a thousand years from now where will we be and what does that entail for how we behave today and especially how we 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 lay down in the human sphere the laws and the principles um that are you know more moral um, and so I find a lot of bliss in philosophy because um, you know we are able to think about these principles. I find it also very frustrating that we don't um, talk about this philosophy more, and that links also to kind of a certain cultural blindness that is pervasive, unfortunately, in the world uh, where we are, don't have the same right and access to truth, whatever truth is. It is up to each single human to, to define it. But I feel we do not have all access to the same amount of, um, uh, of opportunities to access truth in a way that is, um, you know, I'm not sure if truth can be universal, but the fact that we turn around the sun is a truth, right? There's no discussing that. Uh, the fact that our blood is red, or at least we perceive it red, it's a truth, right? Um, and, and there are many truths uh, like that that are just, basic that unfortunately do not get to every single human mind. Um, and so anyways, I'm talking about a lot of things and kind of driving. Um, a, yeah, totally, because it's like, it, it's so interwoven. I mean, some aspects of it are, you know, coming coming out of the, the sort of the rhythms of the planet, mm -hmm. like the rhythm where we are in our own rhythm. And even when it comes to the, the greater works of, you know, people like uh, Ken Lacavara, who's done a lot of work on paleontology and has actually even named his own dinosaur, um, talks about like where we are on the great sort of grand clock of time, where we are right now and how much of like a couple of seconds of the actual great, you know, 24 hour clock 
would you actually be a, you know, a human being or in existence? So in the grand scheme of existence, we're almost a blip. And yet when it comes to the sort of the mass extinction element of things, we are, you know, ultimately, um, we are ultimately existent, existing at a time where we as a human species have been able to, you know, really extract as you as you say, but also to to um, deplete our resources in in a manner that has really awoken all of us as to the power we have over the land, over our time here, over you know certain behaviors. And I think that you know whether it comes to one of the things that I remember, and I think both of us were sort of really promoting a lot of this uh, a couple of years back, was um, where you put where you put your money, I remember, I think this came out in the Replenisher sort of book, where you put your money, where you where where you put your morsel is the vote in the system that you want to create. So, you know, where it is that you make that choice is the, ultimately, all of these little morsels end up being, you know, a mouthful, end up being a stomachful, end up being, you know, the- The industrial uh, food system or not. <laughs> Totally, totally. Mm -hmm. Like when you start to sort of map it out on an aggregate, like aggregating all of it, you really observe greater consequences based on very small and simple things like the tomato that you took a bite of, right? The, to the, the, um, the I don't know, something that you bought, like a product that you bought that you have in your home. And I feel that on the grand scale of you know, the, the entire process of humanity or, or how humanity has evolved and emerged, there is a sort of almost like this, the most insignificant piece of it all is the most significant of it all. That's like the biggest contradiction is that the most insignificant thing, the fact that I went to the shop and I bought this one envelope has a consequence. And yet, for some reason, it has been, you know, uh, for, for, for whatever reason, it, it, it doesn't seem that way. If, it, it seems as if, like, oh, little old me, what are you talking about? I can't have that kind of an impact, right? It's that little thing. And I feel that there is this, the, the choice dynamic, the opportunities, the privilege, the, all of these things. You could be in the laps of luxury and or none of it at all, but you made a choice that had consequences for the rest of us. And for me, that's probably the most powerful thing. You have the power to make mm. that small, insignificant thing matter, because mm. that's what's happening in our lives today, where, you know, yes, it's easy for us to say, well, <clears throat> things are a little bit easier for me. Maybe I've got more access to information or data or people or whoever, but you still got access to people, you know, the information that you have, and you're still like that beautiful, um, Netflix, Netflix documentary by Craig um, Craig Foster, you know who I'm going to be uh, Swati, his partner. I'm going to be interviewing tomorrow, actually. But it's all on like my octopus teacher, and there's a there's a beautiful moment in that where where Craig sort of talks about we have to we, we it's almost as if we are visitors to the planet, like mm. we're not part of it. It's like you know that's over there. Well, I'm, I'm visiting for a short period of time and then I'm going to pack my bag and I'm going to go. But it's almost as if there is this sort of identity of becoming one with nature and that we are nature. And I feel that, you know, at your father's farm, for example, these are some of the experiences that you not only have imbibed, but you also have shared with the rest of us. This sort of like the cycle of a season, the food and how, you know, from seed to growing it to like the, the, um, the journey and the knowingness of, plowing the land right like milling the like understanding the land understanding the quality of the land and i myself have um you know had the the beautiful gifts of the harvest of your land as well um which we've all very very much like thank you very much for that um we've uh you know we've explored not only the the relationship that you have with the land but also with ourselves understanding as we as we taste the difference, because that's the thing. I mean, it's not to quote, I think it's saying spruce, taste the difference, but it is, it's literally tasting the difference. Um, you know, an experience that knocks you sideways because you thought that this is what honey tasted like. You thought that this is what tomatoes tasted like. 
And yet in the entire process of that tomato coming to your supermarket or that honey coming to your mouth, there is an entire industry in a supply chain, a logistical fashion that almost uh, reinforces certain behaviors that, that are up in question at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the dark side of abundance is that we forget um, that food is sacred, right? That is having water, yeah, clean water to drink. If we were thirsty enough, we would remember how sacred it is. And by sacred, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm really putting it as a word that ev everyone can interpret with their own truth. But the point is that um, uh, these, these, these life basically that we consume um, is shaping the world that is around us on a very physical sense, right? And I'm not talking about um, non-physical realities, just the atoms, right? That, and how they come to you. And so I feel that reflecting on every single atom that we interact with and we put in our bodies um, and trying our best to be in alignment with the systems that make that work is one of the key aspects of, um, uh, of us playing a role in human evolution, right? Humans and, and, and the planet's evolution. We have become as a species, the, like the brand new evolutionary force of this planet. Um, before that evolutionary forces were different, right? And Darwin's theory, um, you know, still rings true uh, in the wild, right? Of natural selection and, you know, uh, random mutation, natural selection. Um, that still is, still is true, but we are able to hack life. Um, and this is just something that we've been able to figure out in the past century um, or two, let's say, if we think about certain hacks on plants that we've been able to do by kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, like genetic manipulation without getting into the DNA, but just like, you know, mating different species uh, of, uh, of plants uh, is already genetic modification. We are architects of life, hence. And so I just think that we're really babies in that, in that aspect. Uh, we're just being born to our power as a species. We're just being born to understanding, um, like, you know, I, we often talk about, ontological awakening, a, a, an awakening of what it means to be human. Now, what, what does that mean? How, how does that reflect in, in the laws, in the systems, in the economy, in the architecture of our spaces and in our social architecture, which is how we gather, right? Um, and how we understand uh, community and how we shape community. Um, and so kind of many different aspects of that. Um, um, and I invite the audience to, to, to look at, um, at the principles of regeneration, at the principles of regenerative agriculture as one of the manifestations of re regeneration. Um, I heard one of the most beautiful ideas I, 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 I came across in the past um, year uh, was actually uh, a talk in, in uh, Northern California where uh, scientists talked about um, the next step of human evolution, right? We are Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, the next step being Homo regenesis, um, which is hopefully, right? Um, meaning that we are the the species that um, uh, that regenerate. We are architects of life. And as our dear friend uh, Amanda Joy Ravenhill, director of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, says, um, we can become we can choose, we have a choice between being apex predators, right? Like the biggest predators of the planet. Um, nothing beats us, we beat everything. We can eat everything, we can control everything. Or becoming apex healers. Apex predators or apex healers? Which one do we want to be? Because, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's really a, a, a game of choosing, right? So if we choose being the healers, that means that we are the generators. Um, that means that we, we try to bring goodness to life in all its forms, uh, being ethical um, by how we bring life, right? Like right now there are, I think it's 20 billion um, animals um, in cages that we have bred, 20 billion. So that is something that, you know, at scale, I'm not sure if we can put kind of a mark on, on, on consciousness, what is more valid? the consciousness of a pig or the consciousness of a human. 
it is scientifically proven that the amount of emotions um, of uh, and, and, and kind of um, let's say the, the index of consciousness of, of a pig, uh, of a young animal, uh, sorry, of a, an adult animal is the same as the amount of consciousness in a young human, right? We're talking about tooth, like a baby, a human baby and a, 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 an adult pig having the same processing capacities and the same levels of consciousness and awareness of itself. We have millions of these animals, uh, billions even, uh, if you think chicken and, and in cages. Isn't that going to go down as one of the greatest crimes in human history? Like we had a Holocaust, which caused, you know, one of the greatest, the greatest crime, uh, arguably about uh, human, in human history. Um, and, and, you know, this just thinking that what I'm talking about here is about ethics, about morality, about how we connect and, and how we uh, treat nature, how we are responsible for it. And that connects to the very simple mundane burger, the 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 the, the Sunday roast, the you know, the the Christmas dinner, and and so our culture itself is created on the basis of injustice and of immorality in many cases. And the problem is not that in, in thinking that you know, oh we should change what the traditions are around Christmas dinner. But we should definitely be aware of what we're doing. Just the awareness of knowing where it is and then being having enough integrity to, to questioning our stance on certain things that we take for granted. Um, yeah, that's something I had to say. <laughs> so that was really, thank you, Charles. Um, <clears throat> there was something really beautiful that we did during the Panama retreat mm. that we hosted in 2016 we really thought quite a lot about what kind of experiences that we could use once we were inviting well over 100 and i think 50 people to the um Kaluyaka jungle something that we thought a lot about was what kind of experiences do people really feel are rituals right mm -hmm. these sort of like ri the rituals of christmas and religious rituals and like gathering rituals it's almost as if these rituals have become you know um, open for discussion open for curation um, understanding of the indigenous r rituals as well and one that i will never forget which i never got to go to but everybody who went did tell me about this um, was the ritual of killing of death mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious if you remember this. Um, a number of people went to an island directly after, and one of the rituals that, or, or sort of like invitations to an activity, really, that you'd invited people to was the killing yeah, of a lobster. I, I framed it. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about <laughs> so, that? It's not. Obviously, not killing of the lobster. Sorry, I'm a vegetarian. Of no. course, I would say that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But like, but but it was the. The holding of the the life yeah. of another being in your own hands, and it was it was something that even shifted my own perception of why I'm you know I, I choose not to because I mm -hmm. I can't exactly. take the life of something I'm just yeah. really bad at it I wouldn't be able yeah. to but Thank you. but please <laughs> please tell us a little bit more about it what were you mm. thinking about it and what and how did you sort of how did you map it out yeah. as an experience um, what were some of the experiences that people actually had like what was what was the feedback. Yeah. Thank you for uh, bringing that to the conversation. It's a beautiful memory. Um, and actually, yes, yeah, so it is, uh, it is, um, uh, so this is how I framed it, right? We were with a, a, a group of, you know, um, really inspiring humans um, connected through the friendship of, of a global community. And, um, and I wanted to, to, to bring that kind of conversation to the table. And the way I framed it was, we're gonna do a workshop before dinner. Everybody's invited. I'm gonna be cooking tonight. Uh, we are going to be cooking tonight and we're gonna do a workshop on animal ethics. This is how I framed it. The day before I went and talked to, to, the, to, the, to the locals, to the, the, the stewards of this island and this marine ecosystems and the beautiful fragile ecosystem uh, that are the San Blas Islands um, in, uh, in Panama. And we had, um, I asked them because I, I have kind of a connection to the culture, the Caribbean culture in, in, uh, in Colombia. And I know that um, 
Islanders kind of always have in reserve some 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 seafood that they eat. Um, and so I, I asked them like, where are your lobsters? And and they're like, oh yeah, you know, okay, come and see. And so we went to to, to a place where basically they put food waste in a, in a cage, and they just um, they get uh, lobsters right, and that's kind of one of their staple uh, ingredients. Um, uh, of their of their culture and eating soups of lobsters, etc. So, there were these live lobsters, and I invited people uh, to observe. Um, you call it a ritual, I called it a workshop, not to scare people off. Um, but it was about you know an experience becomes a ritual when there's deep um, kind of intention uh, put into it. Right, the intention that I brought was I wanted everybody to witness to feel what it means to eat a lobster. Uh, most of folks that were there uh, had eaten um, lobster. I think everybody there, uh, if maybe a, a couple of exceptions, um, had eaten animals in the past. So there was uh, an, act, an, an act of, uh, of killing uh, happening, of sacrificing um, happening in, 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 the, in the diet of all of us who were there. Um, and I just wanted to visualize the act of taking the life of an animal in order to feed, which is something that many were surprised to even realize that they had never experienced it. This is how much under the surface this reality is. We've never seen it. It's not only that we've never seen it, we've never thought about not seeing it ever. And so these beautiful lobsters, um, and I showed them how to humanely take the life of the lobster, um, trying to make its suffering as short as possible and um, and trying to ethically not have any other lobster know that they were going to die, right? So this is making a lot of assumptions on, 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 on lobster consciousness. Um, but um, so they were in the water in a little cage, unassuming, and then one by one were taken to a table, were covered in their eyes, and then were taking the where the life was taking with uh, with a with a knife that basically kind of um, cut them um, cut their head in two. Um, that is the reality of, of eating lobster when it's not kind of just put in boiling water straight away. Those I invited everyone to see it to witness, which was already strong. And I, then I said, "This is the lobster that I will consume tonight. Um, if you want to eat a lobster tonight, uh, you have to take the life of your lobster yourself." And that was an invitation for a challenge to, 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 to step up to, to knowing if you are able to take the life of the animal. And of course, this animal doesn't cry, it doesn't make noises, it doesn't kind of wiggle in all parts. It's, it's very easy to take a life of a lobster uh, as compared to, for example, a 500 pound pig, uh, which is what, you know, you know, the size of the, the average kind of um, hog that we would sacrifice for making ham or something that is kind of the most kind of normal thing, right? To, to have in supermarket ales. So that was the invitation and that's kind of, uh, you know, I went into a bit of detail, but um, I could go into more. The point being that just the fact of facing death, which is something that we don't have enough conversation about in general, all right? Death, just like um, sex, just like, um, you know, all these other important, things that are about life um, are not talked enough uh, about. So, um, that's so, so yeah, powerful. just- So yeah, powerful. I mean, one of the things that reminded me so much, and the reason why I suppose it, it, it came to my ears was because somebody had said, I'd never done that before and mm. I couldn't do it either. Mm. And it was interesting because as a as somebody that's brought up in, in um, a, a Hindu household, where we've, we've all, uh, of course, in the house had, you know, do we eat meat? Do we not eat meat? Why don't we eat meat? How come this is allowed? This is not allowed. Why should we do this? What, et cetera. All of these conversations have been part of it. And the one that for me still holds true is the one thing that I just can't being immersed in, you know, the Indian Ocean um, whilst diving, for example, and having this beautiful shoal of fish just swimming around me and thinking, I, just can't. I mean, I, I can't do it myself. That's not to say that somebody else can't, but it was really beautiful once when I visited, um, I mean, traumatizing, but I suppose I can understand it. But there was a moment when 
uh, Khalid Al Shamsi, who from Abu Dhabi, uh, one of the first ever organically certified farms. It was an absolutely bizarre experience in I think 2011 or 12 when the both of us went for a tour with Alex from Ichea, the uh, certification agency. And we went for a tour around Tuscany just to identify some of the core farms that had incredible practices. And we came across Poggiofoco. And one of the activities was to, um, to, to eat the meats of the land. And of course, as a vegetarian, I, you know, but I'm, yeah, this is not my thing. And I remember Khalid asked me to, 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 to record him taking the life of uh, a, a, you know, a lamb. And I, I was like, I just can't, I'm sorry, I'm just, I can't do this. I can't, I can't do it myself. I don't want you to do it either. I appreciate that this is the, this is a practice in the ritual and, and the aspect of, of uh, relationship with food that you have. And I want to honor that. But at the same time, I kind of, can I just like exit stage left because I can't, I can't do this. And it was fascinating because I ended up staying there because I thought, this is the only time that I would ever be in this experience because I would by choice never be there to see that. But it was interesting because I carried on like, um, just to say a side note, that was a really crap video that I'd recorded because um, obviously I was like devastated, but I was taking the video and my, my camera skills obviously were like secondary at that moment as I was like, looking into the eyes of this lamb whose life was ending as Khalid had, you know, done uh, an Islamic sort of death ritual on um, the lamb. And just the, it was looking directly at me and I can never forget it looking at me. And I, you know, I looked at the animal whose life was, was almost like leaving. And it, and it was such a strange experience of, of um, the, the consciousness leaving out of this animal but also um my insides were were so upset <laughs> my insides were like angry sad uh, at the same time like really you know wanting to know like what i could do about it but obviously my first response was to try and help and get it out of that and you know yeah i found it really really difficult and to think that this was a more animal sort of like a friendly way of doing it. This is kind of like the best way if you are to take the life of an animal to do it in the least harmful way to the animal. And I could see that and I could understand it. And yet deep inside me was the, I can't do this. I know, I know I can't do this. Um, mm. But coming back to the experience that, you know, giving people the workshop of where food actually comes from and how it is produced and how it is, uh, how the life of it is taken is probably one of the most important responsibilities that we have if we were to take the life of an animal ourselves. How is it that we would do that? It Does it come so easily to us in these abattoirs and the manufacturing process almost of food that we've lost all sense of the consciousness and, the, and as the the Hindus would call it the karmic relationship, right? Like the, the holding of the karma of the death of something, that which is uh, consumed within your own karma. So you sort of like take on mm. the karma of something else. And, and, and what I love, and I'm going to link it to the Arawakas when we were there, was this sort of conscious exchange of consciousness and life force. It was like the coca leaves, for example. Every time we went to visit somebody in the tribe, there was the, the mochila came out and there was the you know, these are the cocoa leaves for you. And then there was a receiving of the cocoa leaves. So there is this beautiful interaction and play. The um, Kalahari tribe have this like tracking sense and knowing, you know, when almost as if like the entire body becomes the eyes and they're all aware and they're all present and they're all knowing that there is an animal that knows that its time has come. Mm. And instead of fighting, has received the the almost like the um, the the call of the moment, the conscious call of that moment, which is I am about to be food, but I have accepted that is my karma. It's so mm. weird. It's so interesting. I find it like um, mm. intriguing because this is something that you know you've 
you've not only held workshops on, but you personally educate people about all the time. Mm. All the time, the the morals around food, the understanding around food, the where does it come from? Why have these processes, you know, almost like featured, like veered off any kind of moral grounding? And that's why I feel philosophy for you is such an important subject because through philosophy, you also get to express the you know the ethics of what you do and why you do what you do. Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing as well the, the story and your presence in the, the death of, of this lamb. And I think, you know, going beyond the conversation of whether we should or not eat animals, I think that is, it's an important conversation, but I think that sometimes it is framed around um, some people being right and some others not. And I think that we don't need more separation. We don't, we need to just convene on on, on principles. And I believe Personally, I'm not a vegan, um, but I do feel a, a moral responsibility to watch for everything that goes into my body. And of course, teaching about it. Um, in, and that's why I call myself an educator out of all the things that I could call myself. And it's been a struggle to be like, okay, Charles, who are you going to be in this lifetime? Are you going to be an author? Are you going to be a this? Are you gonna... I call myself food educator oh, because I feel that this is important. Um, what I wanted to say in regards to to, to animals um, and in general everything is how can we honor the, every single bit of life that goes into ours with love and with respect? If this lamb has been loved in his life, fed well, given a beautiful landscape to wake up to every morning, given you know community to for him you know to mate to. To, to have friends in, in, in their own kind of, you know, lamb consciousness, live a good life. And this animal is respectfully taken out uh, of, and then fed into the life of your children, eventually, um, in awareness, not just like take some plate of food here. No, in awareness. Did you hear that sound? That was the lamb dying, son. Learn, respect. You know, this is not a killing, it's a sacrifice. And by sacrificing, the change is, 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 is important, right? And this is why I kind of, you know, I honor, um, for example, uh, halal and kosher um, traditions where it is a sacrifice and there is a prayer uh, going into the death, uh, before the death of the animal. And of course, this is also done in many indigenous uh, uh, cultures and kind of uh, cosmovisions. Um, the point being that industrialism is the problem eventually, and the commoditization of life is the problem eventually. Uh, and when I say industrialism is that, okay, we will, you know, this is how this life works. We're just going to tweak it and reproduce it and put pump some things in it in order for it to grow fast, just like in the industry. Uh, and thinking of natural resources, um, which is, life itself is a natural resource, as something that we can own and control at our own will for our own kind of uh, purposes. And of course, this is fed by this wrong idea of, of the very basics of the economy. And I would love to hear yours because you're an economist. So, but, but the fact that we, in economic kind of principles, um, take it for granted that growth is, it can be infinite and growth is something that we can just you know, never stop. Um, achieving, right? And uh, and we've had, and I would love to hear uh, you a little bit on on on, on this uh, actual principle, right? This idea of GDP, which is completely outdated, right? And how can we create uh, eventually uh, indexes or ways of measuring, um, you know, abundance, success, or, or 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 prosperity that is not based on 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 a, on, a, on an extractive uh, and impossibly infinite growth paradigm. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Totally. I'm and, to yeah. 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 Happy. Happy to jump into that. And also to apologize. I didn't want to at all say there was a right or a wrong to eating animals. No, no. It was for me like a real experience to see the death of something in front of my eyes, mm. and and it just made me realize and appreciate that there is for me so much respect that I have now for having seen somebody have the 
the honor and the beauty of taking the life of something and as you called it the sort of the the sacrifice the sacrificing of a life has in itself its own beauty like if you see the way that you know um the 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 kind of like something can uh, and i also i also think that this is almost an experience that could be something really powerful for people to experience if you are you know if you eat whatever you eat to know where your food comes from to know you know how to take the life of it i think this is you know almost like a standard experience that just like we learn how to cook we learn how to harvest our food that's it that's where i'm gonna leave that one um when it came to the actual um gdp uh metrics i think these metrics are really quite fascinating because we we sort of latch onto these metrics and then we use these metrics as the be all and the end all. And I feel that that GDP from the 1930s onwards has become this metric of success. It's like, hey, we are so successful. Our GDP just went up. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, you know, these are these are. It's like social media. I've had like you know five likes on this and 20 likes on that. It's like the one that had 20 likes might be a bit more appropriate, and I'm going to do more of that. So it's always a, a tug of war between metric and what it is that you're not actually measuring and those that those things that cannot be measured or have not been measured and why they haven't been measured and in most cases it's the level of awareness as you just using that word that you used earlier that we're not aware of the factors of the environment therefore they haven't been in the measure of our success we haven't been aware that you know just as you know the um what was his name um Larry Fink at uh, BlackRock, I believe it was, talking to his shareholders in the letter saying that, you know, um, the climate risk is an investment risk. If we have any issues on the climate, it will have consequence on our investments. And of course, he took it from a financial perspective. But the reality is, if you have no food, then you're not going to be living very long. Um, and if the climate is ravaging the environment, then you're not going to be living very long. And and unfortunately, what, we, what we've had to do is an interim period, uh, whilst there is a lot of lack of consciousness towards this, is to introduce financial me measures, almost like ecosystem services, almost to say, like, what is the worth of? A fish. Hmm. What is the worth of a tree? What is the worth of the clouds? What is the worth of the of the transboundary nature of all of nature in itself? What what is the what what is the ec uh, the economization of everything? The sort of you know the the quality that it brings into our lives. How can we measure that? So what we've done, unfortunately, for a really long time, is we've measured things on the amount that you spent. So if you spent money on cigarettes, let's say, just giving you one example, but you um, spent cigarettes, um, money on cigarettes, and then let's say down the line after smoking, kind of like chain smoking, smoking like 40 cigarettes a day. Now it's, uh, you know, your lungs are pretty awful looking um, and you've been to the doctors and the doctors say, well, we're going to have to operate on you. Um, I'm not too sure because I'm not a medic. I have no idea uh, what kind of... Um, solution that they would give to you let's assume that you've got lung cancer and if it's cancer then it's got to be um you know cut off um forgive me surgeons i have no idea uh but imagine if you did and if you had to have like your lungs cut off that would be a cost to the health service and the health service would have to triage right we've got you know a pair of lungs let's say i don't know if we could actually uh transplant a pair of lungs but imagine if you could um then we've got a pair of lungs they're available here's charles who uh, doesn't smoke nicotine cigarettes and here's Tia who smokes nicotine cigarettes who am I going to put them into right that Tia's been doing it and it's a it's a matter of habit it's a matter of choice um there is going to be ultimately a triage between the two of us because there's only one pair of lungs so who's going to get that pair of lungs but nobody teaches you at school that your that the actions that you take have consequences you know mm. behind the scene is a pair of lungs that cost the NHS money, that cost you know me money because I've been spending lots of money on my cigarettes. But but there is no consciousness, there's no ethics or morality to the money that I've spent. And so within this scope of the GDP, it doesn't really matter what I spend money on. Both of them have increased the value of the economy by a set amount. Both of them make the economy look good, but there is no consciousness behind it. There's no like, oh, this is yeah, but but ultimately I'm dead because I have no lungs that can help me survive this. Mm. So it's, 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 it's almost by 
introducing the economy in that manner of growth and using GDP to do so, we have lacked any kind of understanding of the consequences of such or the responsibility of such. And if you were to look at the responsibility of it, it doesn't matter because it's an external to the system. Don't worry about it. That's outside. You don't even need to measure that. Don't worry about it. So it's, it really yeah. does put this, the real consequences not on the agenda. It, it means yeah. that your map has got like a massive gap, the gap in the map. And that gap, don't worry about it. Somebody yeah. else is going to look after that. But that yeah. somebody else never really does come. Just like in Naples, mm. piles of rubbish because, you know, the mafia... <clears throat> most probably had something to do with the, the local infrastructure not collecting any of the rubbish on the streets. And people, instead of reducing their rubbish and not putting it out and thinking, well, we're not allowed to create any rubbish anymore, what are we gonna do because we can't live in mountains of waste, continue to do so. And that caused one of the biggest issues in waste collection, I think in our history, especially in the history of Italy, where it's like, well, who's gonna come and collect it? It's not my responsibility, I've left it outside. Hmm. Yeah, and, you know what you what you say makes me think of um, of this. Uh, let's say I, I would I would call it even lack of courage, um, lack of of course uh, guidance, but lack of courage to to truly look at things um, in their true form. Meaning that I personally believe that. And this is might be a polemic statement, but I, you know, I, I, I ask for permission to just share something that feels true to me. Uh, I'm not, you know, pretending that this should be something that others uh, should or, you know, would or could think. Um, but I do feel that believing that there is a life, life after death is a lack of courage to see that this is the only opportunity that you have. Your living kind of time is now. And, it's, and, and you have no chance after to try and live peacefully, to try to live in paradise or to try and, you know, or to, to have all these other opportunities. This is it, right? And that requires courage to be like, listen, this is it. It's not, there's no thing, nothing after. You have to show up now, not, not after you're dead, right? So, and I feel that it's kind of confusing that some belief systems uh, are based on the fact that you will be fine after and you have to behave well okay, now because otherwise, yeah. right? And it, it comes with, with this this other kind of aspect, which is kind of, you know, kept on thinking about it where so much I, I wrote it down as you were speaking, which is this invitation for everybody. Um, this is sapere aude means, um, it's Latin and it means dare to know, dare to be wise. Because in many cases, we don't dare. We don't, I have personally friends and I love them and I, and I love them for everything, even, even, you know, but some friends that say, I eat animals, I'm not capable of seeing an animal die. I don't want to see that. Like, I, I don't even want to talk about it, right? I want to still keep on believing that this animal didn't die, uh, that this is just food. Give me that permission. So that's that's okay, right? And pers people have the chance, the, the opportunity, and the right to say, "I don't want to know that." But knowing is a courage, and the invitation is there to be wise, there to know, right? Every single human should be informed about what happened in the Holocaust. Every single one should know what happened, and that's very important. But every single one, every single human also should know, and something that bears in my heart very heavy that many cultures were completely erased, not just like in the Holocaust, kind of an attempt to erase a culture, which is a horrific uh, thought, um, but actually in Latin America with colonization and many places with colonization, we erased culture, we erased language, we erased history, human history that belongs to everybody. And that is there, and there is trauma that comes from that. And now we, you know, and there's trauma being created right now. How do we deal with that, right? By becoming apex healers is, in my opinion, the most efficient way. And knowing that we can heal from these things, we can learn and we can be intelligent enough if we dare to know that there is a better way and that to try not to commit the same mistakes. Because if we keep on making the same mistakes over and over again, it's simple. This planet will get rid of us. 
we will not survive. And that's I for like many that people today, it. it's like, okay, you know, I'm just going to live my life. But then your, your grand, 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 grandchildren might think that you were unethical to not use a stronger word. Um, but that's, the, that's the, the, the reality that we're facing right now and the turning point that we're living in this early 21st century. Just wanted to let that sink in a bit for me. It is, it's, it's one of the things that came up and I know that we're coming towards the end of our time online right now, although there's gonna be a follow-up, I can feel it. Um, is, is this, uh, what does it mean to want to know? What does it mean to have the courage to find out? What does it mean to go somewhere with no knowledge of what you're going to go and find out? What happens when you take, you know, absolute bare essentials and go to a place and not necessarily, not, don't go there because you know the destination, go there because you want, want to find out. You know, you want to find out, you want to know. And I think this is the, you know, if I may, the, I'd almost like to summarize um, our talk today on, the pursuit of almost like the the, the pursuit, pursuit of knowledge is one thing but the courage the holding of the heart right like the in Cur in that word it's in itself is heart like hold in your heart the ability to go out there and go and find out and it's not about you know oh i'm going to find things that i don't like maybe you will maybe you won't maybe you'll learn something maybe you won't i mean i really do think this um the exploration phase of research and development for yourself and knowing, you know, during this sort of lockdown, during all of these periods where we're arising to the challenge of the moment, like the number of things that people have been doing globally to kind of work together and like, hey, we're going to work on this together, we're going to work on that together. And it's not for any specific carrot. It's not as if somebody held, you know, um, <clears throat> an award if somebody can find out the solution for the you know uh, a covid pandemic or an immune response to that but there is so much um there is so much that we can do but by being present and aware that we are on this journey not that you know we're going to leave it for somebody else to do that uh, that it's somebody else's fault or anything like that but that you are the one who's putting that morsel of food in your mouth you are that person that decided to yeah. do whatever it is that you decided to do. That small step that you take is a choice on the consequence line of the entirety of human history because you're part of it. As, mm -hmm. you know, Craig Foster says, you're part of this earth. You are not a visitor. It's not as if you bopped in and you're like, right, got my backpack, go and have a look over here. Nah, nah, it's not my responsibility. And then see you later, guys. Yeah. Hmm. I do want to say something about what kind of a, a, a precision, right? We, we're, we're talking about how important it is that choice of, 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 you know, you choose, like you take the morsel and put it in your mouth, right? I think there's something that we need to acknowledge and it's the privilege of choice that some of us have and some of us don't. And that privilege of choice is informed by the education that we're given, which is state controlled in many cases, um, and, and hence, right, and, and, and also so education is state controlled. And another aspect of, uh, of this kind of freedom or privilege of choice is where you live, because you're, you don't choose where you're born and you might be born in a, in a suburb, um, a food desert, um, a ghetto uh, in, in, in anywhere in the world, right? A place where there is no food, there is no green, the air is polluted and uh, nutrition is scarce on your own. Like your mother did not have access to the nutrition and hence your body did not. And then well, in your early ages, food at schools was not enough nutrition, not enough diverse. So you are able to be full human in your full capacity. And that is something that is right now a failure of the state in many places around the world. And hence, we can talk about the freedom, but we need to acknowledge this privilege. And then hence, I want to also invite everybody to think about something uh, uh, Socrates said, uh, or was it Plato? I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, but we are political animals. Politics means, comes from Latin, Greek Latin root polis, which is the city. Organizing the city is politics. We are, if part of a city, if we are, you know, we are political. 
And hence, voting is the minimum thing we can do, if we can, especially people in the US right now <laughs> should be you know, there. Second is we vote with much more than every four years. Um, you know, we vote every single day as we consume with our money. And that we, we kind of went full circle, right, coming back to that point in this conversation. Uh, but it's really fundamental that we understand the political nature and the importance of our voice and the importance of our imagination as well. What we think is possible on this planet during this lifetime, we are able to do it. And we can think in a protopian way, bringing the ideal future that we dream of, our children, for our, for our, for our grandchildren, to bring that to the present and make it happen. Um, that's kind of, I guess, my commitment, but you know, an invitation for everybody to sapere aude, to dare to know, and to become political animals in every single decision we make on a daily basis. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Thank you, Tia. An, an, an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and also um, to, to give people an opportunity to find out more about your work. Um, there is a contact email address that people can send um, an email to you and also you know very excited um, you know to, to share the final table on Netflix if you haven't seen it already please go ahead and and check it out and uh, yeah the next time you put food in your mouth just think about where it came from and or mm. you know what your relationship to your food to your table to the vote that you're taking can be and the consequences on the planet not just for you Thank you so much, uh, Tia, for this time and for the openness and for the um, the prompts uh, that allowed for a very enjoyable conversation. And thank you, everybody who's who, who watched uh, us. And uh, thank you um, for your attention and presence. Gracias, Tia. Bye. Gracias. <laughs>